Welcome to the Working CEO Podcast, where we share real advice for busy business leaders. No business school BS, no sugarcoating, just straight talk about how to get work done. Going to the dark side is how journalists describe a career switch from truth seeker to spin doctor. Our guest today has made that journey from editor-in-chief for a leading tech magazine to marketer-in-chief for her own tech marketing firm. Stay tuned to meet Callie Henderson, senior partner at Buzz Theory, who will share advice for leaders transitioning from corporate executive to entrepreneur. I'm your co-host, Susanna Song, VP of Marketing at Highwire Networks. And I'm here with the working CEO, my boss, Mark Porter, also CEO of High Wire Networks. Mark, happy new year. Happy new year to you, Susanna. Glad to get back at it. Yes, our first recording for 2022. And I'm happy to continue our series and bring in our first female entrepreneur, Callie, who uh, I absolutely respect and adore. We've uh, gotten to know each other pretty well over the past couple of years as I've leaned on Callie and her team over at Buzz Theory to help with Highwire's marketing initiatives. So welcome, Callie. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be a guest on your podcast and congratulations on this new one, Working CEO. What a great topic. Yeah, and I, I can relate to going to the dark side. Um, it's funny because we used to joke about it in journalism school. Uh, and it's pretty typical, I would say, for journalists, uh, actually now more than ever, to make that jump to communications, PR, marketing, uh, in that realm, right? In that writing kind of communications realm. But Kelly, you took it a step further, uh, a leap, if you will, to starting your own company. So what did you learn from that experience? And starting my own company or, or yes. going dark? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about why you decided to switch careers. Yeah, first. well, I mean, um, I was fortunate that I was in the technology space and um, was, you know, making a good salary. But, you know, to your point, a lot of journalists really are um, underpaid. And so a lot of the reason that they switch is, is because of that. For me... I had been doing the same thing for about 25 years and um, I uh, really wanted to get back to something where I could create wealth for me because I was making a lot of money for other people, right? And some of you may be in that same position, some of the listeners where you're working hard and all your innovative ideas and all your efforts and your leadership is going to make somebody else rich, right? Um, after a while, it kind of gets to be a bummer, and the, the media company I worked for sold a few times, and uh, the people that had shares got some pretty nice payouts, but that wasn't me. And so, so, <laughs> so, so wait, Kelly, so you traded a really good paying job for a really bad paying job as an entrepreneur? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, how, how did that work? Yeah, so, but the idea was to, um, you know, create opportunities and wealth for for my family, but also opportunities and wealth for um, people that I wanted to work with. So, and it's taken a while, but I've been able to bring in some of those people. So the other thing too, is sometimes when you work for um, other organizations, you're, you're under their rules and their culture, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it isn't. So we wanted to create an environment where our employees knew that they were well appreciated and they had flexibility and those types of things. So there was a second piece of the puzzle too, for me was creating that environment um, for uh, my uh, employees as well. So, so when you were, you're, you're sitting there one day and you decide you're going to take the leap, right? And we've all kind of had that moment. I remember <laughs> laying in bed, uh, relatively newlywed uh one evening and telling my wife that well i didn't tell her we were going to uh buy the company um i told her we had just bought the company oh, uh, oh. <laughs> uh, nice. uh, myself and somebody else yeah, it was a good uh, you know i was i was a little friskier back then uh she always says do what you want uh but uh and i'm sure that's what you told her like, you yeah. tell me that yeah you would have said that so uh, <laughs> it, it apparently doesn't actually mean that 20 22 years of marriage later i've finally learned that it uh I still sometimes don't uh 
follow it. But I remember that night and telling her, uh, her only question was, well, what happens when there's not enough money for a paycheck? Um, I said, well, then we don't get one. She didn't like that part. And she didn't like, I said, which brings us to the next part, which is, you know, my paycheck is going to be about 35% of what it was before. And if there's extra money, we'll get more. Um, it turned out to be a really bad night after that. So you, you, everybody kind of has that moment. What, what, what was that like for you when you decided, okay, we're, we're just going to do this. Did you prepare for this for a while? Was it spur of the moment? How did that happen for you? Yeah. We, <laughs> to your point, we had just, um, it changed the way we were paying our mortgage to be like a 15. So the payments were bigger and we were just moving some of our uh, adult children to LA. And I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving my job. And he's like, okay. <laughs> Great timing there, Callie. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, maybe we could have thought about this a little bit, you know, in advance. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> you know? so sometimes it's, sometimes it is emotional, but, um, you know, he had been an entrepreneur and was still an entrepreneur, and I had been an entrepreneur um, many years before, and so I knew that between us we could make it work, and we did. We just had it. We could have been more prepared to make the the leap, but to your point, Mark, where we had set it up, and I would encourage people to do it the right way, but it doesn't always happen like that. Just well, that's like, a, that's a really interesting, um, statement right there. And that's, you know, as you said before, uh, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm winging this. And this is why we, this is exactly why we don't script it and exactly why, um, we don't really even talk about it beforehand with our guests is we really want to get kind of the journey, the story. There's just so many different ways, but Th that that statement implies there is a right way. Do you think there is a right way or, or, or is it, you know, it in your heart when well, it's the right way? I think that, um, you know, having the chutzpah to do it sometimes is what happens with people like yourself. Um, it's just, you're just going to do it because sometimes you just have to do it. You just have to jump in. Um, but it would be nice to be a little bit more prepared. And I know people who have thought about it and they save up a bunch of money to your point so they can pay their bills and they do, they do the prep work to be able to make it work. Um, I knew that it was going to work out. I knew that I was going to, it was going to be okay, but you know, I also was joining a firm that was already in existence and I knew that I was going to be able to bring in more business. So having that confidence um, was okay for me. It might be something else for someone else. So they sure. might need to have, you know, six months of all their bills to be paid in order to make that leap. And that's fine. That's a good decision, I think, but you know. Sure. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes, um, you know, when we look at acquisitions, uh, one of the things you're always worried about or concerned about is if you buy this company and the owner wants to stay on, you know, uh, will they stay hungry, right? Depending on how they're, you know, how the financial arrangements are, are, are they still going to be motivated? I actually have a belief that when you, um, I mean, let's face it, six months isn't all that long, right? And, and I hear people talk about that, you know, the, getting their lifestyle set up to be able to go without a paycheck for a period of time, whatever, um, whatever that number is, I actually think that there's just really something to being hungry and having to succeed, right? Not everybody will do it, but I do think that's just, you know, we're all a little bit different, but for, for a lot of people, especially people who have that entrepreneurial fight in them, and it is a fight most days, there's probably something to that having your back up against the wall and having all your friends and family know what you're doing and, you know, just not wanting to fail. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, <laughs> the, uh, the idea of it not being successful is very motivating. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, but I will say there's also preparation that we, that we make. So for an example, um, what is that phrase that people see, say that luck is when opportunity meets preparation, something like that, right? right? Yep. 
Well, that's the case um, for me. So the first time I was went out uh, as an entrepreneur, I already had some um, experience and then I was easily able to transition to a consulting job. Um, but because I had been high profile in the marketplace, um, I was able to get a job, uh, you know, a consulting gig, which I had for seven or so years when I was just in my 20s. So then when I went back to public, that was what, like six, six years ago, seven. Uh, yeah. Seven. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but when I went back to publishing for, um, you know, another uh, couple of decades, um, then, <laughs> then I, <laughs> he says shyly. <laughs> yeah. Then I, um, you know, uh, that base that I had already built, um, you know, had expanded because I was, you know, I was able to leverage all of those things kept building on each other. And I, my network of people that I was working with uh, had expanded, um, you know, exponentially. And so my visibility in the market that I serve now as a marketer, which is the technology space, which is how I met you, um, you know, a lot of people know me. And so I had those kinds of connections and the knowledge and the experience and all of that stuff behind me before going out. So it's a much different thing than if you're just, you know, graduating college and deciding you're going to open a business. That's a lot harder of a decision. Sure, to make. Yeah. But once you've been experienced in the marketplace and you've got your connections and your experience deciding to be an entrepreneur and bring in something new to the marketplace or to you know um go out on your own or whatever is a different decision and so i don't want to make it seem like you know i'm like this fearless person or reckless person even worse you know no it wasn't like that at all so well i don't think um i don't think there's anything wrong with being uh considered fearless i actually consider you uh, pretty fierce and fearless and actually oh. <laughs> um for what it's worth uh, it, um uh impressive when it comes down to it, your your knowledge and the way that you 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 do something and i think i shared this with you when you presented it to us it was it struck me very uniquely because it's something that we do is that you the way you priced and packaged a service deal in a way that made it like a product and in a way that made it something that we could immediately relate to and understand what we were getting was very unique because we had been through, um, we had been through a couple of vendors that we were talking to that had these very elaborate processes and all these things. You did all the same things with us over the course of the journey, but I understood what I was getting for the pay for, for what I was paying. And in reality, I think over the long run, we've probably spent far more with your, with your organization than we would have with those other organizations, because the value was there. The value you, we, we were extracting from that was there and the return was there. And we believed in, in what you were doing with us. And I think that was really critical. And I, as I would say, certainly not reckless. Um, in fact, I think you're very methodical, but um, I certainly wouldn't sell yourself short at, at, at uh, not being, you know, it, um, it, it didn't seem like you had a whole lot of fear in you and you certainly have the confidence, which I think is one of those common traits. Um, I think it's weird. I think confidence and self-doubt are, are two things that most entrepreneurs uh, in their heads uh, bounce back and forth at any given hour of the day, especially early on. Right. We, uh, I think that's been a common oh, theme. Always. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. it's, uh, well, it's, it's actually a really common theme, um, that we talked about with, um, uh, my good friend, Jeff Wald, and, and he's had several very successful businesses, uh, that he started and exited and continues to do. He's just an amazing human. But one of the things he's very honest about is that he's struggled with self-doubt and even depression at times um, because the business, and we talked about it in our, in our podcast, and this is where, you know, things really get, I think this is where hopefully, I know uh, uh, for me, it's important. This is where I think the, the value for people who want to, are thinking about starting their own business, want to start their own business, have to understand um, that, that you're going to wrestle with those things because at times it is very isolated and, and, and lonely 
and even your family doesn't understand the things that you're going through or, or the, you know, that, that you go to work every day and you almost have to put on a persona when, you know, there's not enough money to make payroll in two or three weeks and you got to figure those things out. So have you, have you had any of those sort of moments where you were wrestling with the decision and wondering if it was the right thing and how, oh, how do you work through those things? Yeah, for sure. So especially, um, and this is, will be no surprise to Susanna is marketing, um, as is, which is what we do and what we help, we help you guys with is, very different than it was 10 years ago. And in fact, it's changing day to day to day, right? It's a very different exercise and it's extremely technical, much more so than it used to be. Um, so understanding that, you know, you got to stay on top of all of that and be knowledgeable can be somewhat intimidating, right? So, you know, saying, okay, I don't understand everything and being okay with that and learning what you can, um, that you can train, you can hire for that. You can, you know, there's lots of things you can do to fill those gaps because as an, as a, as the leader of an organization, sometimes you want to be the one that knows everything. Well, that's just not, possible and also i will say too it's a person there's a personality issue with that whole self self-doubt and what you've got to do to get yourself comfortable so for a lot of us me for example i need to have a lot of ducks in a row in order to get okay i think i got this now so i prepare and i but other people are a little don't require as much preparation. So it's probably continuum. You know, other people are like, I'll figure it out, whatever. And they do. And that's Susanna fine. works with somebody like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you can be successful in both ways, but understanding where, where your comfort zone is, is really important. And for me, it requires quite a bit more preparation when I'm not, when I'm learning something new, I'll want to be more, um, caught up on it, right? And um, I think that that's common with a lot of people. And so I might spend more time preparing for something than, than the next person. Or, some, or I might spend less time compared to somebody who's maybe more OCD than me. So you know, this, <laughs> this depends, right? Well, you, so, you hit on something in there and, and that's uh, when I talk to people who are getting started or thinking about it, or even people who are just, you know, sometimes stuck in their career or stuck, uh, stuck on a task. Um, and, uh, a lot of, you know, I, I tell people sometimes that the, you don't have that, that concept of feeling like you have to know everything. You don't have to know everything, but you do have to be able to figure it out. Yes. And, and that's because look, I mean, in any given day, I'm sure, I'm sure you deal with this in any given day. I mean, right now we're dealing with uh, vaccine policies and mandates and regulatory environments, the likes of which we've never seen before. And then you've got, and everything is personal to every single individual in the company and you're never going to win. Right. That's, I, I, I was, there's nothing that prepared me to know any of this or, or, or even begin to understand it, but you figure it out. Right. And you, mm -hmm. when I talk to other entrepreneurs, um, the one thing that I've seen with the most successful amongst them is that they've always had people around them that they could learn from or call mm -hmm. on. And in my case, there's a series of people, you know, if I look back on my entire life, there's a series of people that for some strange reason wanted to help me all the way back to, you know, when I was a kid, right? Yeah. Um, like there, there are, there are special ones that stand out in your life that just gave you a hand up or, or an opportunity or saw something in you that maybe you didn't see in yourself as an entrepreneur, when you recognize those people and you have to recognize those who are willing to help because they are there when you're looking for them. And I think that's something again, that Jeff and I talked about, um, that's a really important thing is be able to accept their help and to hold those people closely. And if they're willing to help you out of the goodness of their heart, and there's plenty of people who want something from you and all that stuff. But when you find the ones who truly are trying to help 
embrace that. Don't, don't be afraid of letting those people in, or don't be afraid of showing some sort of weakness yes, because you right. need their help, right? That's the point that I think you were trying to drive home is when you are getting help from somebody that automatically means that you have to admit that you don't know. And that's super hard for people when they feel like they should know. And um, I think that understanding that this person is here to help you can help you get past that saying, okay, yeah, I really don't get this. And I really need to, <laughs> I really need to get it. And I really need you to point me in the right direction is super helpful. But they also, these people that you were talking about, you know, they may have been on the path that you're on before, which is really great because then they can also say, you know what, I was here before and this is what I did and it was right or it was wrong or, hey, don't do this because that didn't work out, you know, <laughs> that's helpful. So you can, you can avoid a lot of mistakes if you listen to these people rather than trying to do it on your own. So, but I think that network that you were talking about and it might be a couple of mentors or sponsors depending on how you want to look at them or it might be just friends, um, you know, that network that you're building over time is all important to being a successful entrepreneur. And um, I would encourage everybody to be thinking about that, especially if you're really considering it. How have you fed your network? How have you built your network? And I'm not saying to do it in a, what's the word? Like in a way that's just all about you. You've gotta be genuine about this, making these connections. But if you're looking around you and your network is not very strong, then you might want to think about how to change that before you decide to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> so, because it really helps. And I have to tell you that, you know, for me, there were a couple, you know, several people that were really important to me making a transition to a successful um, uh, marketing agency. And one of those was my network of women um, I belong to several women's organizations in the technology industry, and they just completely rose to the occasion. And, you know, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I, I do have one question for you, Kelly. I want to sneak yeah. a question. And I think you're in a, you are in an interesting position uh, as an entrepreneur and also like a marketer, marketing master, right? So you're helping other business leaders grow their company through lead gen and customer retention, but you're also trying to grow your own agency. So what kind of advice do you give other companies that has proven to work for your own company success? Actually having a plan and, and executing on it is really helpful being consistent about it. So um, one of the things that, that entrepreneurs often do don't do is they don't create that discipline and cadence around the things that are important. So for us, you know, marketing has become more center stage for us now. And um, we actually have processes in place to do that for our own organization. But we, what we had to do was make ourselves a client in order to make right. that happen. So, um, you know, and it, it took us a little while to figure it out, but part of the reason was it's a scale issue as well. So as we started to bring on more people and more people, we're able to actually um, assign capacity to ourselves as a client, as well as to others. And yeah. that might've been a similar thing that happened um, with you guys or some of the other people that are, that are in the audience is, once, you know, if you're a, a solopreneur, a lot of prioritization has to happen. But as you start to build your team, some of the things that you said, well, that's going to happen later, actually is going to get done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's part of it too. Not that it's easy, but it, um, it eventually starts to happen, but you have to, you have to force it. And I know, um, Mark, you, you have, um, put in operational processes like with EOS and things like that at your organization to make force some of this discipline into your organization. And those kinds of things, those kinds of tools or guidelines are really important for entrepreneurs to be thinking about in order to create that level of discipline um, that, that's required when you're scaling your business. Um, 
two things I'd like to wrap with. One is a plug for your business, because I have to say, um, mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about Buzz Theory. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I know Buzz Theory as Cali, essentially. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm always happy to send people your way if they're looking to understand it. I will say as an entrepreneur, um, I think marketing might be the most misunderstood part of it. Everything else is very finite. Sales people either sell or they don't. Um, rules and regulations are there. And if you break them, you get whacked. Uh, you know, uh, you're either making money or you're not. You're cash flowing or you're not. Marketing is hard. And it took me uh, 16 or 17 years. And, and one of my shareholders letting me spend a day with uh, his marketing person. And the things she shared with me in that day, uh, she agreed to four hours and it went on for like 12 uh, because I had question after question after question, but I was eventually starting to get the gist of it. And then I was fortunate enough to get engaged with you uh, shortly thereafter and learn even more and watch the process and watch it unfold and learn to see how it, how it changes a business and what it has done for us and propelling us forward has been nothing short of remarkable uh, to me. Uh, and, and, and I think I've shared this with you, Callie, marketing is strategic. Susanna reports directly to me. Um, I think she's the only, my only direct report without a C-level title. Um, but it's because marketing is so critical. It's what we're talking about to the market. It's the way we communicate to people our message, right? And um, and the way they communicate back to us, the feedback we get, what's working mm -hmm. and what's not, and now how to measure it and how to, you know, how to, how to calculate the returns, which I think is the area that everybody always struggles with. It's not an immediate gratification and it's not a, it's not easy to see, well, I spent this and I got that. So any thoughts on, yeah, on that? Sure. So, you know, attribution is always hard. That's what, you know, tying activities to uh, revenue, right? That's what you want. And then we've talked about this before where, you know, with the, when you're with sales, you got the one thing, you know, their job is sales. When they get a sale, you see it. <laughs> That's yeah. very, very straight line, right? Marketing can be, you know, you've had 10 or 12 different things. And I think uh, the number actually of touch points that somebody needs to actually convert from, you know, being interested to being a customer is like, 15. Well, 15 touch points, how do you decide, okay, well, the, was it the first thing that made them a customer or the last thing, or was it something in between or all right? of the above? That's why it's, that's, <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. it really is all of the above, but how do you attribute that? And how do you say, well, that was important and that's something we should keep doing. Yeah. So it's, it is a complicated thing, but I will say that for entrepreneurs, you know, that all of the most successful companies in the world are visible and they have very extensive marketing, even on the B2B side, if you're doing B2B, but you know, clearly a lot of us interact with brands on the B2C side, but it's very clear. None of the really successful companies in the world go without marketing. They well, just when you look at, when you look at, um, you know, as we've matured and grown and budgeting and all that stuff and, um, Susanna's colleagues were a little jealous when she <laughs> presented her budget and I said that's not enough that's <laughs> that's it that's it's not even close to enough um music to we, my ears and still we <laughs> yeah. until we start seeing the diminishing returns mm -hmm. um you know then then you start to figure out you know is is what you're doing working but you're right about the when you look at what larger brands are spending and especially in the tech space and you look at the oh. fact that they're not even making money they're mm -hmm. spending to build the brand and to build the product and um i'm gonna go out yeah, on a limb and, and say that the brand is more important than the product in a lot of ways they spend more time and energy on the brand and and capturing mm -hmm. sales than they probably should on making the product work we <laughs> see this time and again uh with with startups in the cybersecurity space and and even companies that are publicly traded they're spending more marketing uh that it, because it's a it's a, it's an arms race right and you can't win that arms race if you're not out there building that brand 
Right. And, and to your point, though, I mean, if you're if you aren't doing marketing, then you're relying on one one or two, like if you're new, a couple mm-hmm. salespeople to be your interface with everybody in the market. That doesn't make sense. Right. You need to get into your one to many relationships. Not that there can't be one to one marketing tools. There are. But you've got to get your one to many down because otherwise you're not <laughs> You're not going to have anything for your salespeople to talk to. It's just, you know, it's, and it's pretty impossible now to not have marketing because of the digital requirements. And I will say that in, during COVID, that was, you know, ex- increased exponentially because we couldn't have our, you know, in-person meetings, right? So yep. and now that's relaxed to a point, but it's still not over. Digital uh, first marketing strategies are all important. And so now your marketing efforts really need to be in the digital space too, if you were doing a lot more, you know, um, live events or other types of media, because that's where people are going to find out about product, no matter what you sell. What's the first thing that you do as a consumer? You Google it, right? You go out there and you listen, you listen to reviews from people you would never cross the street to talk to and take their word for it. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. But that's the way it works in B2B too. We're people, we're, we're, our buying, our buying process is still the same. We're still Googling to find out what is it that we need, right? What is it that's going to solve whatever the problem is? We're going to go on Google and we're going to figure it out. So, you know, that's the place where you've got to be and it's, it's got to be, your brand and your message and you've got to be persistent about it and um you're if you guys take one thing away from this uh conversation if your website is not in order please fix it because that's like your store even if you're not actually having an e-commerce function on your website it's still your store if they meet you they're going to your website to validate that you're a real credible business. They're going there to see everything about you. And if you, if it looks like crap or it doesn't have good information on it, they're not going to call you back. They're just well, not. people don't realize they're shocked when I tell them that they've, that by the time that a customer has actually talked to you, that they're anywhere between two thirds and three quarters of the way through their journey what 70 percent of your the buyer's journey is complete yeah Yeah, they've done all the homework so you know your chance to get in front of that conversation is you know if you're not online you there's ways you can get in front of it but you've got to be present online you've got to be pushing education you've got to be out there you've got to be visible or they've done all their research without you and a lot of times they don't call you because you weren't yeah. in that conversation. So, you know, you're fortunate if you got in the conversation at 70% right now. So you know, that's, you know, and for that's important for entrepreneurs to know. You just for sure. Be for sure. So the final question, and we'll wrap with this is something that I've asked everybody. Um, so okay. as we, uh, you mentioned, I, th- I, I think you said two decades um, at one point, I, I, I don't like to mention doing the same job for multiple decades myself uh, because it makes me feel sort of old. Uh, So, uh, but it's unfortunately the sad reality on both counts. What, uh, what would um, today's Callie tell two decades ago, Callie about, Mm -hmm. you know, starting her own business, joining a firm, being an entrepreneur? What, what would you tell uh, 20 year ago Callie to do differently or better? Yeah. Well, I actually started a business 20 years ago, so it's, we'll have to go back a little further. <laughs> okay. So 30 years, what, so even, be, I, even better. Yeah. What, so what, yeah, it, so let's just say if I was the, the college, when I was in college, if I had mm-hmm. had the chance to tell myself is that um, literally you do not need to know everything in order to do any job, even if it's a a job that you want, or if it's a company that you want to start, don't let that hold you back. I mean, uh, don't go into it, you know, blindly, like if you want to be a surgeon, clearly you have to have (laughs) (laughs) that that education, right? But you can't just sleep at a Holiday Inn Express. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of um, branding. 
Yeah, but I, I'm just saying, I, I think that um, the that having that confidence that you can figure it out is really important. Um, I always felt like I needed to know everything and I wasn't, how could I possibly do that? I have no idea. Well, you can learn it, you can figure it out. You have, there are resources to help you with whatever the thing is, because I think that a lot of us are very fear, fearful of failure and we think we have to understand every little bit about it. And in fact, most of the really successful women that um, have mentored me have said, you know, they've taken jobs that they didn't really know all about it. And that's what helped them to grow. And then they were able to get into the next job. So they learned how to learn, right? They learned how to, how to, how to grow and how to lead. And, um, you know, that's really important. And I still struggle with that every day. It's like, okay, something new is coming along. Shoot, I don't know how to do that. How do I, how do I make this happen? And, you know, I've, I figure out how to do it. And sometimes that's bringing in somebody else to help me. Like, you know, in your case, you guys uh, brought me in to help Susanna. Glad you we did. That happens yeah. all the time. <laughs> right. So, you know. <laughs> Glad we did. Well, I thank you very much for being our guest. I hope that, um, I hope that there's some things, I think there's some things that uh, anybody thinking about being an entrepreneur or, 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 or who is an entrepreneur and is looking for some, something to keep them going because god knows there's always those days um i think there's plenty plenty of takeaway here and i i uh i always enjoy talking to you and uh, look forward to uh connecting soon yeah thank you so much for having me I, this is really fun yeah and if you have uh <laughs> feedback or questions about today's podcast you can contact us at podcast at highwirenetworks.com thank you callie until next time i'm Susanna song and I'm Mark Porter. And this is The Working CEO. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of The Working CEO. Remember, whether your collar is blue or white, roll up your sleeves and let's get real. The Working CEO is made possible by Highwire Networks, a leading global provider of technical, professional, electrical, and managed cybersecurity services, serving businesses in more than 180 countries. To learn more, visit Highwire Networks dot com.